good morning um, everybody in the uh, west coast or good afternoon in the east coast um, it is a pleasure to be uh, here again uh, this year uh, uh, sharing some of the latest things uh, what we have been doing in in our group um, especially focusing on how to design middleware for hpc ai and data sciences not only with high performance but also in with scalability in mind as many of you know, I mean, these days we see either it's like the top 500 systems or data centers or clouds, all these systems are being designed in a commodity manner. We have multi-core, many-core processors, high-performance inter interconnects like InfiniBand, Slingshot, and especially InfiniBand is also with the DPU version and then accelerators from all different vendors and also all the different kinds of SSDs. Uh, with NVMe um, kind of support. So when you are trying to design these systems, of course, these systems are being used for all different kind of workload, uh, traditional HPC, AI, machine learning, deep learning, et cetera. So how do we design high performance and scalable middleware, especially on these heterogeneous environment? So now we have this uh, CPU, GPU, DPU, slash IPU or XPU, whatever you can name. And, and we want to, take advantage of all these resources and really deliver the best performance to the application level. So in this context, if you take a look at it, like hey, we have traditional HPC applications, we have these deep learning applications, and then the big data and data sciences are coming. And there is a lot of a synergy there. And many times some of the newer workflows actually use many of these things in different steps. Like we might be for a workflow, you, you are trying to run some scientific application, generate the data. You are also trying to learn deep learning on top of it to understand some patterns and then also the steer the computation. So in these kind of things, the idea is that how many different kinds of runtimes do I need? Especially today, I'll be trying to ask a question and we'll try to show some solutions that can MPI driven middleware be designed and used for all these three domains. As many of you know, MPI is the message passing interface standard has been there for almost now 30 years. And every time a new networking technology comes or a GPU technology or even a AI technology comes, people are trying to provide support for MPI on those machines. And they take care of both like a scale up as well as scale out. So the question is, if we have a very good MPI library, can we actually not only try to satisfy the HPC, but also use the same underlying runtime to take care of deep learning, machine learning, big data, data science, everything, so that you don't need to redesign any of the underlying systems. So in this context, I'll introduce three major projects in my group. Um, many of you might be familiar. If not, I'll start with the MHAPIS MPI library project. So this is where I'll try to show you how we have done some of the design and some sample performance numbers for various CPU, GPU, DPU, and networking technologies. And then I'll try to focus on this high performance deep learning slash machine learning project where we actually have provided a built-in path for all of your like a TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, um, any of the like a K-Mean, all of those things can actually run on top of the MPI library. And in that context, I'll also try to show some examples like how you can accelerate deep learning with a DPU. And then I'll move to the high BD, which is a high performance big data project. And here we have actually provided now links to the MPI library so that you can actually run or, and accelerate Spark with MPI. You can accelerate Dask with uh, MPI. And these are all the activities from the OSU side. Um, we also have a commercial spin-off. Uh, it is uh, called Excel Solutions. In fact, Excel Solution is a sponsor also of this event. So I'll be talking a little bit about the commercial support and value-added products and then conclude. Now, if some of you are not familiar with the MAPIS project, uh, we started this project almost like a day one of InfiniMath. Um, InfiniMand, if some of you remember, was introduced in October 2000. Uh, we're the very first group in the world to really come up with an MPI library to take advantage of the InfiniMand. Of course, at that time it was SDR, single data rate, and now we are talking about NDR, uh, um, uh, 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 400 gigabits per second. And uh, we first demonstrated this MPI library at um, Supercomputing O2, um, almost like a 22 uh, plus half years back. And since then, not only we started with InfiniMan, but now we have actually expanded to all different high-performance networking, Omnipath, um, IWARP, Rocky, AWS, EPA, OPX, Broadcom, 
uh, Intel Ethernet, Rockport Networks, Lynx or 1011, all these things we, we support, and also all different versions of MPI, TGAS, and all. And I'm very proud of my team. Um, we have been working on this project for almost now 22 years. Uh, more than 3,300 organizations have been using our software in 90 countries. And just from our website, we have crossed actually 1.65 million downloads. Um, our stack is also a part of the Red Hat, SUSE, OpenHPC is packed. Uh, we don't keep track of those um, and a lot of other vendor software stacks. And not only that, it's also empowering a lot of top 500 clusters over the last um, 17 years. Now, MIP, of course, has different versions. Um, these are some of the latest development. We have the 2.3 series. The latest one is 237. That is the mostly used, but now we have in the before SC, as some of you remember, we, we started a new 3.0 series. And the, the main thing here is that now not only our design is exist, we also have support for OFI and UCX. So that what that means is now you can actually use MAPIS library, not only using the it's our customized version, but also you can run it on OFI and UCX substrate for any other in networks where there is no support to go uh, down. Okay. And that is the MAP itch, which is the, the public version. This is also the open source version. And this is what, if you remember, we have a MAP to GDR and MAP to X. Now we are actually consolidating that. We call that as MAP plus. So again, in the next few weeks, you will be seeing uh, some continuous releases coming out with more and more features here. So in this context, I'll just try to start with the MAP just talking a little bit of, of course, I mean, these designs have a lot of um, uh, solutions. I'll just focus on very simple, some RDM enabled designs, CUDA awareness design for GPUs, and on the fly compression, how you can take advantage of compression on the fly to boost the performance. And then I'll also talk about how you can accelerate applications with the DPU. So these are some sample numbers. I mean, these are like the MD Milan, which is the very latest systems with SDR 200. Uh, we are actually working on NDR, um, and then we'll be able to give you some numbers in the next few weeks. Um, so here again, we get very good performance like intra node, core to core, as you can see, like a, almost like 190 nanoseconds we can um, send and inter node is around like a 1.9 microsecond. Um, and then the bandwidth wise, both internode and internode, we are trying to saturate the uh, available bandwidth. But that is like a point to point, but as you know, many HPC applications and especially now all the deep learning machine learning application focus a lot on collectives. And in fact, for the last few years, there was a lot of activities taking place in collectives and collectives again has two different varieties like one is a blocking operation. So here, if you can see, these are the, some of the numbers taken uh, with SARP. Uh, SARP is a product from Mellanox plus NVIDIA, and we have done a very tight integration of that. And this has been taken on the TAC Frontera system. As you can see, it is the largest infinite system, almost close to 8,000 nodes. And as you can see, compared to like the MAPIS 2X, which has the software design, we have done the tight integration with SARP. We are able to improve performance of all reduce, barrier reduce by big manner. But those are the blocking collectives. And now, especially with this, DPU technology coming up, I'll spend a little bit more time on that. There's a lot of focus on non-blocking. So what does the non-blocking collective mean? So that means let's say I'm trying to do an all to all, instead of doing a blocking all to all and waiting for everybody to finish, which takes a lot of time, the CPUs are idle. Instead of that, I can initiate the all to all, but while the all to all is going on, CPUs don't have to remain idle. They can actually perform the computation. These are the like the green lines and then so that you can actually get overlap of computation with communication. But the big challenge is that in order to do these collectives, you also need some entity, processes, threads, or some kind of resources to progress these collectives. Now the question is who will do that? And, and especially let's say on a, uh, on a, on a uh, multi-core system, if you are using all your cores for a computation, there is no process or thread free. Um, or a core th free to, to do the, um, the progress. So, and this is where uh, the bigger challenge comes and I'll try to show you um, how you can take advantage of the DPU technology uh, to not only support the non blocking collectives with the best possible time, but you can also exploit overlap of computation and communication and then boost the performance of your application. So, but before I go to the, the DPU technology, let me, these are some host-based things. They are also continuously, we have been enhancing. These are like high barrier, non-blocking barrier, non-blocking all reduce. And as you can see, like this is a 
the blue lines for MAP is to 236. This is the green line is MAP is to 237. Not only we are able to try to reduce the time, we are also trying to improve the overlap by reorchestrating the communication. Those are the dotted lines in, in both cases. So that means I can actually overlap computation with, with communication. So those are some of the infinite band numbers. This is also from like this 3.0 series onward. We also support Slingshot um, 11, which is being used on the Frontier system. So here you can see like a, we get around the two microsecond latency. Um, this is for internode. Uh, and, and this is also bandwidth and bidirectional bandwidth. We also saturate the network. So these are like the, some of the sample numbers from the, um, the CPU technology point of view. Uh, we have been uh, making progress, trying to bring the very latest uh, cutting edge designs. Now on the GPU side also, we have been optimizing uh, in the MPI library for many, many years. Uh, if some of you remember this word or you have come across CUDA aware or GPU aware, uh, in fact, from our group, we introduced this terminology in 2011, almost like 12 years back uh, in a paper at ISC 11. So the idea was that if you have a system like this, you have the GPUs um, connected with your uh, InfiniBand network. Now, most of the time when you do some CUDA programming, you do a CUDA mem copy to the host, then you send it again to the network, and then you do an MPI receive, and again, you do a CUDA mem copy. So especially for large messages, the the latency is very high. So we introduced these concepts of CUDA where MPI library, that, that means as a end developer, if you have like, if you have launched already a kernel and the computation is running there, now instead of bringing the data to the host, I can actually send the data through, through the uh, network. And this is where we work very closely with NVIDIA at that time and also Mellanox, uh, the coming up with the GPU direct RDMA or a GDR. That's how the MPI library has moved to the GDR uh, kind of uh, technology. And as you can see, uh, there is a short animation here. That's how the um, data moves. And here you can see, you can just use like a standard MPI send and MPI receive, but instead of the host buffer, you provide the device buffers and receive device buffer, that's all. And that leads to high performance and high productivity and a lot of all other MPI libraries not only that, TensorFlow, PyTorch, a lot of these libraries, even big data stack, actually they use this CUDA aware concept. But that is like the, the basic solution for the last several years. We have actually working to the next stage of the design, which is the on the fly compression. So think of like a GPUs these days have so many cores. Of course, we are trying to take advantage of that in the computation state, but when we are trying to do the communication, a lot of these cores are idle. So the idea is that if those cores are idle, can we actually take advantage of those cores to compress the data, especially the large data, and then send it so that the overall latency will be shorter and the bandwidth wise you will improve. But of course you have to pay some penalty at both ends because you are trying to do more compression. And this is the paper we presented at the May IPDPS 2021. It got the best paper finalist. It was best paper finalist. And here you can see like some sample numbers like AWP ODC, which is a seismic simulation, we are able to boost the performance by almost like a 35%. This is the higher is better here. And the right-hand side is the overall execution time and the runtime we're able to reduce by 26% or 50%. Now that is for the point point. So gradually over the last several years, we have actually gone ahead and brought those designs into the collectives level. So here it is like a performance of all to all with online compression. We presented last year at IAC. Same thing you see like a PSDNS application, we can reduce the uh, overall execution time by 30%. This is a all to all used in the deep speed uh, for the deep learning uh, recommendation model. So this is also, we can try to reduce overall execution time by 35%. And that is for all to all, similar kind of things here. We have also done for optimized all to all B, which is much more complex. And here also we are trying to accelerate. This is like a hefty library uh, for all different uh, uh, system sizes. Uh, we are able to actually boost the performance. And all these are available actually in the very latest release of the MAPS2 GDR. So these are actually on the um, NVIDIA GPU side. We also support AMD GPUs and we have just the Intel GPU support is coming up. So here again, some sample numbers. Um, this is um, running with the AMD GPU. Uh, we have the integration with the uh, Rockham Aware uh, software stack. And uh, as you can see, like a GPU, GPU within the node, uh, we can actually do intra-node communication MPI level in 1.75 microseconds. And these are some of the inter-node 
in four microseconds, uh, we can try to uh, take care of the things. Now let's go to the DPU because this is the new uh, toy in the town kind of things I can say, um, the very latest technologies. So not only we have like InfiniBand having the RDMA logic, but we also have several ARM cores sitting here. So I consider it like a executive and assistants. So you can think of your main processors are like executives and these are the assistants. So just like in our normal offices, we take help from our assistants to accelerate day-to-day -day tasks. Can we try to do that in our HPC environment? So I'll try to show some two things here and in the next section, I'll try to show uh, one more. So here first I'll try to do, especially for the MPI, trying to do non-blocking collectives. I introduced earlier with the DPU. And there again, the DPU technology has been evolving. And very recently, there's a new interface has been introduced, which is called um, uh, um, GVMI interface. And I'll show you very fresh uh, numbers uh, with this new GVMI interface. So we have a library, which is MHPS2 DPU, which is being developed by Excel Solution. I indicated about the commercial startup. So it is based on the MHPS2 releases, and it actually supports all these MPI, I all to all, I gather, and I bcast. And uh, the first thing is the overlap. And this is what I introduced earlier. Like if I can have these ARM cores take advantage of these operations, then I can get a full overlap of computation and communication. And that's what the green lines show. As you can see, the red lines, uh, these are the host-based thing. We have eager protocol, rendezvous protocol. There are a lot of handshakes going on. So you cannot get very good overlap. Whereas as you can offload to the DPU, overlap goes to 90%, 100%. So these are some of the numbers with um, I all to all. That is a non-blocking all to all running on 32 nodes. And this total, the, the time, what is being shown here is the overall time. So that means I initiate the all to all. I perform the computation and I'm trying to show the complete number. And if I get the best overlap with my design, the, the number will be, whichever is the lower number will give me the best performance. And these are taken with the standard OSU micro benchmarks. Many of you are familiar from our group. And uh, so as you can see here, this is like a 32 node, 16 PPN, a 512 process runs and a thousand process runs, just an I all to a level. You can see like a 22% kind of improvement. And then the question is, can we try to take it to the application? So here we have worked with the P3DFFT um, application from San Diego Supercomputer Center. And we worked with them to, to actually convert the application from the blocking to the non-blocking. And that's what we are running here. And, and as you can see at an application level, again, on the 512 process runs and uh, the 1,000 process runs, at an application level, we are able to give you 21%, 18% benefit. So these are a little bit like a few months old designs. And, and this is where I'll try to show the new designs, what we are working on, and that is known as GBMI. So to illustrate this concept, so the initially, like the last year when the Bluefield technology came, so this had support only for stage transfer. So think of like a host memory. I have this DPU memory and, and the DPU host. So instead of like the typical host, I can do an RDMA from one host to the other host memory using RDMA, but with the DPU, we had to do an RDMA read and then do an RDMA write. So I'll call that as a stage transfer. But now there is a new GBMI transfer interface has been provided where I can tell the DPU to directly take data from this my memory and then write it to the other memory. Okay, so it's just like telling assistant saying, okay, take things from this office to that office or move from this mailbox to other mailbox or this to file. And if you can do that, as you can see, almost it will reduce the cost of the data movement by half. And that's what actually these are the numbers we just taken like last week. Some of these numbers we have taken. Uh, this is again, the same 32 nodes. Uh, I all to all what I had shown earlier. Earlier I had showing, if you remember the 22%, now you can see it has almost doubled. So that means I can get, this is the host and this is the DPU, I can actually get 46%, 45% benefit. Um, so with the, and this is for like a 32 nodes. Uh, these are on the 16 nodes, very similar kind of things also I see. So that means with this new interface, it provides actually not only reduces the, the, uh, the latency for the non-blocking collectives, it also allows me to have good overlap between the computation and communication. And that's what we are exploring. At this time, we don't have all the application-based numbers. We are actively taking a look at uh, to, to have the best designs. Uh, might be in a few more weeks, uh, we'll have very good numbers again, that p 3 dfft and other kind of applications to see how it works with the GBA point. So with this, I'll try to summarize the MVAPH part. Um, 
Uh, again, I mean, it's a 22 years old project. I just provided some sample numbers. Um, these are some sample uh, testimonials kind of things. I the Idaho National Lab, they have been extensively using MAPH. Um, here, if you see like, uh, these have been presented by them. Um, last year, they were using all different MPI libraries, but in the 2022, Almost all their users have moved to um, MAPIS 2. Um, you must have heard of like recently this NASA's DART mission. Uh, we have been working very closely with MAPIS 2 uh, running on the NASA, sorry, Lawrence Livermore lab. Uh, a lot of the simulations have been done over the last 12, 13 years and MAPIS 2 library is enabling uh, to really push the frontier. And uh, also the nuclear fusion research. Um, we just heard about that uh, talk. Uh, same thing, we have been working very closely with Livermore uh, to push the frontier of the research. So that is the basic HPC. Let me quickly move to the other things. Um, because the MPI library very nicely provides the scale up and scale out, can we take advantage of for machine learning and deep learning? And this is what we have done. Um, if some of you know like a horror word or toss distributed deep speed. So these are the kind of the, the middleware which people have been using, like a TensorFlow, PyTorch, and MXNets. And then on top of these, we have MLDL applications run. So what we have done, we have done a tight integration with our MAPIS library. We call it a high DL or high performance DL project. So you can actually download it from here. It actually gives you very detailed instructions. You download our MPI and exactly how to build the stacks um, so that the end users don't have to make any changes. You can still use your TensorFlow application, PyTorch, or came in or any of those, but you will get the boost in your performance. So that's what I'll try to show you two examples here. One is a AI driven digital pathology. And then I'll also talk about a little bit how you can accelerate uh, deep learning with the uh, with DPU. So this is the example where we have worked on model parallelism. Um, as you know, like uh, these days, the GPUs uh, have increased memory, but your model sizes are also increasing. So it becomes very hard. Sometime when you are trying to do a DL training, to fit your model exactly within one DPU. So, so you cannot really use the, the data parallelism. So here we have gone ahead into model parallelism. Uh, here the example is like a pathology whole slide images. You can see like these are 100,000, 100,000 pixels. Uh, people try to do some kind of a tiling, but then you lose a lot of accuracy uh, in your training and these edges. So here we worked with actually our pathologist uh, a friend at the Ohio State University. Uh, they had their basic design. They were just running on training for one node, one GPU. It was taking 30 hours and they were not very happy. We worked with them for three months. We actually presented this at the supercomputing uh, 2020. As you can see, like a, with a, just three months work, we were able to reuse that to almost to 27 minutes. Okay, and then we were able to give you a boost in like a 22x uh, performance kind of things. And it shows like a, using this underlying MPI runtime, you can actually provide good scale up and scale out uh, for these deep learning applications. Now, recently we have also worked on exploiting the DPUs to, to accelerate the DNN training. If you take a look at uh, some of the typical training workflow, you will see like a data augmentation, training, and model validation. And especially now, this is a CPU-based system. Think of it, you have a CPU only, not GPU. Uh, we are working on some of those solutions uh, uh, currently. But if you have a CPU and DPU, then the question is, how do I divide the workload? So this is just like going back to this executive and assistants. How do I divide the workload between executive and assistants to get the boost in performance? So, so we, we have done this distribution, like a training process can run on CPU, data augmentation can run on DPU, testing process can run on DPU. And using that design, we have actually an XKL AI DPU package. Uh, this is again available. You can also always contact us. This is based on the very latest MAPIS 2237 with Horoboard 0.25. It supports PyTorch framework for deep learning. And these are some sample numbers uh, on 32 nodes. Uh, you can see like a running uh, training of ResNet 20 v one with CFAR 10 data set, we can give you like a 17% improvement in your deep learning time. So um, training time. So that means the it is the same network. The question is whether you use your DPU cores or not. If you use your DPU cores, then you are getting a boost in your application performance. This is another example. This is the training of the SuffleNet model on the tiny image data sets. And here we get around like a 13% improvement. So these are again, based on the staging design, 
we are actually again started exploring this how this new GBMI interface can actually also give boost in uh, performance. So then let me go to the final segment, which is the big data stack. Um, as some of you might be knowing, we've been working on this big data project again, almost for last 10 years. We had an RDMA version for Spark, um, Kafka, HBase, Memcast, et cetera. So there we actually went down to the real InfiniBand verse level. And these were some sample numbers you might have seen from earlier presentations, like instead of IP over IB, as you can see, if you do the RDMA level designs, you can improve by 37%, 40%. But those were primarily we are done for InfiniBand, but now you see so many different networks. So now if I take the same design, of course, it will show benefits on network X, Y, and G, but I need to totally redo the design. So instead of that, we are trying to go one step further up and saying that since MPI library provides a runtime, why don't I directly take the Spark on, run on top of MPI? And that's what we have done. As you can see, like a, um, if some of you are familiar with the Spark stack, we have the native transport. So we have actually provided that native transport through JNI to the MPI communication library. So we have actually a release from our website. You can actually download the MPI for Spark. We made the release um, uh, last year. And these are some of the numbers. And here we are saying like a, compared to even the vanilla Spark, like of course you will get improvement, but even compared to our RDMA Spark design, we can even give you far benefits because uh, time has moved, MPI libraries have been optimized, so they, those are much more optimizations compared to what we did in the RDMA Spark a few years back. So, um, so these are some of the additional numbers. Um, uh, again, on the SGR uh, 200 gig, uh, similar kind of things you can see, like a almost 2.x, 3.4, or 3.5x improvement. These are also very similar number with the Intel High Bench. Um, you get almost like a 1.4x uh, to 1.5x compared to vanilla Spark. So again, these are released. So if you are using Spark workload, you should be able to download our MPI for Spark and run it with our Epistle library, and you will be seeing this kind of boost in your performance. And that is the traditional Spark and Hadoop. But now, as you know, many times in the data science world, uh, there's a DASP that is gaining a lot of prominence. So here we have, in the same manner, we have introduced something for MPI for DASP. Uh, in fact, we just made a release last week uh, with some additional uh, features here. And this actually MPI for Dask now, because MPI library can run on CPU or GPU. Uh, now you can think of the, you can take advantage of that at a Dask level to boost your performance on the CPU and GPU. So here it is like a, some sample numbers. We have run this on the Cambridge Wilkes 3 system. So, so here is the, Three numbers we are trying to show. One is IP over IB, like you just use the IP over IB features of InfiniBand versus UCX. That solution is available, but see this red, which is the our MPI for Dask. So you can get almost like up to 32 workers. You can get a boost in performance by a factor of seven or eight. Uh, this is a matrix dot, dot benchmark, um, similar kind of things with a 1.45x um, improvement. Uh, this is on the CPU system. This has been taken on the TAC Frontera. As you can see, I can go up to like 128 nodes and different kinds of task workers I get improvement uh, varying from like uh, almost 1.9x to 5.2x. Um, and this is the DAS3 release. You should be able to download from our HiVD stack um, and then take advantage of that. So that's what, again, the third piece I want to show that if they have an MPI runtime, you don't need anything else. You should be able to run your, in your data science DAS applications um, and get the boost in the performance. So with this, let me go to the final few slides. Uh, I indicated about this commercial spin up. So uh, even though from the OSU side, we have all these solutions available, a lot of organizations want actually very customized design, tune design, providing just like any other commercial software. And that's what we have done through Excel solutions. And a lot of support is now being provided uh, to many different national laboratories and international HPC centers uh, through this. And, and while we are trying to do this, we are also having value-added products. And I talked about this MAP is to DPU, Excel DPU, uh, similar kind of things are also available. There is an HPC version and then AI version. So with this, let me conclude. Um, now, if you see the, especially in, the, in our HPC field, uh, we have crossed the exascale, but then people have been started talking about Jetta scale systems and all. But at the same time, there is a, a lot of demand from all these different um, uh, domains. So when we are trying to design this new system, we need to take a holistic view of HPC, big data, deep learning, machine learning, data science. And that's what I try to focus here. And uh, 
presented a set of solutions and what kind of sample numbers you can get. Uh, but of course, as many vendors are coming up with better and better technologies, um, there are many more challenges. When you think of like a, the next generation system, we have CPU, GPU, DPU, IPU, TPU, <laughs> everything. You need to really think hard saying how these middlewares need to be redesigned so that we can actually try to keep all these units busy all the time and then boost the performance. So, so with this, I just want to do a little bit uh, seamlessly <laughs> self-promotion. Uh, a lot of our work in the big data computing has been published by MIT Press as a new textbook. We released at August 2022. Those of you who are there at SC, uh, you must have seen it. So if you're interested, this book really provides how the big data field is being combined with the HPC. Um, so I'd like to uh, suggest you to read it. If you're interested, I'd like to thank all our hero, all the organizations um, who have been providing support to us. But these are all my heroes, all the past and current students and staff. Um, what I presented just in the last 30 minutes is like a work of 22 years by almost close to 100 people, okay? So every time I give this presentation, I really salute them for all their contributions. Uh, with this, I'll close here and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, DK. Appreciate the presentation. Uh, just a reminder, uh, folks can use either the chat window or the Q&A window to ask questions. DK, I have a question for you. In, in terms of a uh, slide, just a few slides back, uh, you're showing okay. the performance difference between uh, UCX and uh, what was it? M um, uh, MPI, MPI for Spark or, MPI or for Spark. which one, yeah. the Dask? Right, this, this one? one right here. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, uh, are, are you taking in, are you utilizing UCX at all and then just adding some different functionality and coding on top or is this a no, no. separate? This is a completely running over MPI. So, so in fact, I didn't uh, show the the framework figure here. Um, so, um, I mean, again, you can say two things. Like uh, these numbers were taken with our MPI natively running over InfiniBand, like verbs and all. Okay, but of course, our latest MPI version also has the UCX support. So you can also run through that. But we have not done that that study. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to check in on that. Yeah. Um, let's see. I do have one question that has come in. Sure. Any reason for not using FPGAs in the hybrid approach? Okay, <laughs> wait for six, four months. <laughs> we we have some new solutions being worked out for FPGAs. Um, they are actually in in uh, currently in the pipeline for publication review process. So once those uh, publications get done, you will see actually MFS2 will also support um, FPGAs. All right, fantastic. Um, let's see if you want to hang on for a bit and answer any questions that come in sure. um, via text. That's great. Um, thank you again, DK. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, bye. Uh, I 